what we're looking at today is redundancy and unfortunately um, this is one of those areas of law that is likely to be cropping up again fairly soon as we appear to be heading into another recession. Um, personally I've been doing this job long enough to remember the last recession and uh, my colleagues managed to make me feel very old by asking what it was like the last time um, and obviously I am very old but that's another issue. Um, what happened last time, as many of you may remember, is uh, after the global crash, um, there were obviously a lot of job losses, but there were also, I think, quite a few attempts to be a little bit more creative about how to deal with uh, reduction in work. And we'll come on to the definition of redundancy in just a second. Um, and I think this time, I'm not making any predictions about redundancy or, or how the, the recession may play out, but I've suspect particularly given the uh, the existence of furloughs or the furlough scheme which didn't occur last time creativity may again be quite an important way of dealing with uh with a possible downturn to avoid job losses where possible obviously as businesses you will all have to make up your own minds about how to proceed um but hopefully we'll give you some some hints and some useful information as we go through today so one of the first things to look at when we're talking about redundancy is what exactly is a redundancy? Because quite frequently, or certainly used to be the case, that employers use redundancy as a nice way of dismissing somebody on the basis that it didn't impute any blame or criticise anybody for their performance. Um, that's a dangerous way of proceeding and redundancy has very specific definitions and they occur, or redundancy occurs in three particular types of situations. So where there's a reduced requirement, requ uh, easy for me to say, a reduced requirement for people to carry out a particular kind of work. So if a section of your workforce or work uh, dries up or reduces, then that can be a redundancy. Where there's um, a business that is closing, quite clearly, or where there's a workplace that's closing. So for example, one branch of a business may no longer be required, and that would be a redundancy. So those are the three types of situation and it's important for the sake of fairness to ensure that you are only applying redundancy or the redundancy procedure to a redundancy situation because failure to do that can lead to an unfair dismissal finding um, even if you actually have a genuine reason for it if you have followed the wrong procedure that can lead to a finding of unfair dismissal and if an employee brings a tribunal claim which we'll come on to in a second uh, then compensation may be awarded um, it won't come as a massive surprise to many of you that the tribunal system at the moment is fantastically overloaded. Um, clearly, when the lockdown began, tribunals shut down as, as much as anything else, and everything that was going to be heard was converted into a telephone hearing, and everything that was going to actually be dealt with has been pushed forward, and in some cases quite a long way forward. Um, I know we're dealing with a few cases where we've got a listing for 2022, um, which obviously has issues for access to justice because how is anyone going to remember what happened two, three, four years ago? Um, but we'll come on to that. So assuming that there is a genuine redundancy situation, the next question is uh, following a fair procedure. And we have, uh, oh, I'll briefly touch on collective consultation because I'm afraid that may also be something that crops up uh, in the next few months and years. Um, I won't go over it in detail, but there is an overlap between individual consultation and collective consultation. But as a general principle, the main point to bear in mind is that where 20 or more employees are being made redundant over a period of 90 days or less, then an employer has a duty to inform and consult with the employee representatives. And when there are 100 or more redundancies proposed, consultation must begin at least 45 days before the first dismissal takes effect. And for a less than 100, then it needs to be within 30 days. There's also an obligation to notify the Secretary of State. Uh, in fact, in practice, BIS or BIS or whatever you call it, however you pronounce it. Um, and that needs to be at least 45 days before the first dismissal, where there's more than 100 employees being dismissed in a 90 day period. And 30 days again, if it's less than 100. So I'm not going to touch on that in great detail, but it's worth just bearing in mind that there are some additional um, obligations where there are larger groups of people being uh, considered for dismissal. Um, there is an overlap between redundancy and unfair dismissal as you would imagine. Um, anybody who has 
qualified for protection from unfair dismissal, which at the moment is two years service, um, has the right not to be unfairly dismissed. And what that means in a redundancy situation is that you need to consider very carefully following a fair procedure. And we'll go through some of the steps that you need to follow in due course. But in principle, those steps will include having undertaken the assessment that there is a redundancy that needs to be, uh, or a genuine redundancy situation, which by and large is down to organisations to, to consider. It's not, um, when it comes to tribunal, tribunals will tend not to interfere with an employer's decision that there is actually a genuine redundancy situation. Um, they will just assume that you have made a fair business decision based on the various moving parts of your business and that it is a correct thing to do. It's only in extreme cases where it's very obviously a perverse thing to do uh, that the tribunal may actually have a, have a word to say about it. But a dismissal is unlikely to be fair unless there has been um, identification of an appropriate pool for selection. And that is usually where you're considering making more than uh, one or two people redundant of a particular type of work. Um, if you fail to consult, and consultation is one of those things we'll come up with, come up to with uh, with tedious regularity throughout this. Um, if there are pools, then there needs to be um, uh, objective selection criteria, and we'll come on to exactly what that means in a second. And also, there's an obligation to consider um, suitable alternative employment um, where appropriate, and subject to a trial period if that's also relevant. Um, Clearly, as with most areas of unfair dismissal, there is also a question of discrimination. And if uh, somebody has been selected for redundancy, but it is actually quite clearly discriminatory, then that will have a bearing on, on how uh, the uh, tribunal considers the fairness or otherwise of the procedure. So I'm just going to skip ahead in the notes a little bit. As I say, I'm not going to go through it line by line because frankly, we don't really have the time or I presume the inclination. Um, we've established hopefully that there is a real reason for dismissal, so a redundancy. So presumably, well, quite frequently, this will be that you don't need as many people to carry out a particular kind of work. Um, and the guidelines we've got there, fortunately, there's no statutory guidelines on redundancy or very few. The main, um, and there's no a, there's an ACAS guide, but that is not binding, um, although it does give us good practice um, suggestions. Um, most of the case, mo sorry, most of the rules that we have on, on redundancy come from case law. And one of the main ones is Polkey versus AE Dayton Services, which is from 1987. Um, many people who deal with employment law are familiar with the, the term Polkey. Usually in the print, it comes up in Polkey deductions. Um, but what the, the case of Polkey really gave us were the main three procedure or the main three steps that are required for a fair um, procedure. And those are, as I say, an obligation to warn and consult employees. So clearly it will be unfair if someone were to say out of the clear blue sky, we're making you redundant. Again, assuming that somebody has more than two years service. If that is the case and someone does say you, we're making you redundant, then that's likely to be unfair because there's been no consultation, there's been no opportunity for the employee to consider or make representations about the proposals. And 99 times out of 100, realistically, consultation probably isn't going to have a great impact on the decision that a, a, an employer may have made or the, the idea of possibly making redundancies. But there will be occasions where an employee may come up with something that as an employer you haven't thought about. And it's always important when entering into a redundancy procedure to have an open mind. The procedures that tend to lead to an unfair dismissal finding are usually those where it is absolutely clear that the employee was dead set on dismissing the employee, sorry, employer was dead set on dismissing the employee at the outset and nothing the employee could have said or done would change that. So it's important to bear that in mind when you enter into it please remember that you have not made a decision. You are concerned that there is a risk of redundancy and there's a concern that the employee may be uh, made redundant, but you haven't decided and it's all up for, for grabs. Um, the other points, of course, are adopting a fair basis on which to select for redundancy. And that comes back to the question of pools, which we'll come on to in a second. 
and suitable alternative employment, which we will again address in a bit. But the main point is that ultimately it's not down to you as the employer to decide if uh, a job is a suitable alternative role. By and large, it's down to the employee because what they may be prepared to do is really none of your business, um, provided they have suitable skills and you actually think about what to, what they have to offer. Um, I mentioned Polky deduction because that's usually the thing that we, we think about when we talk about the case of Polky. And what that is, is to simplify it quite extremely, if an employer employment tribunal considers that a dismissal was procedurally unfair on the grounds of redundancy, but had a fair procedure been followed, the outcome would have been exactly the same, then any compensation that may be awarded may be reduced quite significantly, even up to 100%, depending on what the potential outcome was and the nature of the failings. So that's, again, something else to, to bear in mind. Um, I'll just take a quick pause uh, here to have a, glass, a quick sip of water, but if anyone has any questions at this stage, do pop them in the chat or wave or scream or however this thing works and uh, I'll do my best to answer any questions, so just a sec. Okay, no response, <laughs> so I assume you're still there. Um, we will, I've mentioned in the notes um, the ACAS code of practice. Um, as I say, it's, it, the ACAS Code of Practice on Disciplinary and Grievance Procedures expressly doesn't apply to redundancy. Um, so the only principles that apply are from case law. Um, there is an ACAS guide on redundancies and there's a link to that in the notes that I've sent you. Um, again, it has no statutory effect, but it's considered good practice and we would tend to recommend you follow it as much as you can because what have you got to lose? It's also helpful if you if you have those resources to have um, a redundancy policy, although as with any policy, we would tend to recommend not to make it contractual because failure to follow a contractual policy uh, to absolutely to the letter could theoretically lead to a breach of contract, or a, uh, which is something you do not want to have to argue in tribunal. Um, so by and large, please don't, um, please don't make your policies contractual because there's no great benefit to you. Um, so let's have a look at consultation and what sorts of things um, are discussed. Well, obviously, if we're talking about pools, so for example, if you have uh, five people who do similar sorts of a similar sort of work, and you feel that because of a downturn, you actually only have um, need for, for example, three people to do that job, then there are two people who may be redundant. It's important for the sake of fairness that all five people who do the same sort of work are included in a selection pool. Um, and when you come to consult, it, it's useful to, to be open to, to questions about the basis of selection. And for that reason, when we come to, and we'll come to that in a section, uh, in a second, it's important to be able to objectively justify the criteria that you've chosen uh, to score people on. And so we'll, we'll come to that in just a minute. Um, clearly, Redundancy is a, a stressful time for everybody and particularly obviously for the employees who may be at risk of losing their job and even more so during a particularly uncertain economic time. Um, so it's important to be as much as possible um, thoughtful to their um, situation. Quite often when we actually get into the, the redundancy procedure, employers like to invite people to work from I was going to say work from home. We're largely working from home, so that's really not an issue, but not have to sign in, not have to log in um, or do work during a period that they may be stressed and potentially not entirely happy with you as an employer. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the other thing that to, to bear in mind is, is consultation is supposed to be a two way street. So if an employee has something to suggest, don't reject it out of hand because it might save your business. Chances are it probably won't, but there are going to be occasions where somebody may come up with something that you haven't considered and to rule that out absolutely would be a very foolish step so do do bear that in mind um there's no helpfully no statutory guidance on what a fair consultation period would be case law has said that seven days consultation is the bare minimum um by and large i would try and avoid dealing with bare minimums of anything because 
um, the, the risk of falling foul of a fair procedure are quite intense. Um, so I think it's obviously going to depend on your, your particular business, but if you can, I would suggest at least two weeks would be, um, would be sensible um, just to make sure that you are seen to be considering everything that, that an employee or a group of employees may have to suggest. Um, I've touched on poll key reductions. I won't go through that again. Um, there is no statutory right for an employee who is being made redundant or engaging in a consultation process to be accompanied. Um, but again, I would suggest that it is something to consider and it's usually good practice. Apart from anything else, it, it may lessen the sense that an employee may have that they are very much on the receiving end of a, of a, of a weighty process and the outcome is prejudged. Um, we tend to, as a firm, we often obviously advise employees as well as employers and it's useful for employees to have that support and know that they don't have to focus for example on keeping notes when they are exchanging in um, discussions about their their role so we would tend to tend to advise giving people the right to be accompanied also and we're sort of mixing up the procedure a little bit here but also give people the right to appeal the decision apart from anything else if you're the employer that gives you the opportunity to remedy any mistakes that you may have made. We're all human, obviously, particularly at the moment when we're largely dealing remotely, it's going to be harder to deal with than ordinarily. So it's useful to give yourselves the extra safety net to make sure that if there are things that you could have done better, you allow yourself to do that. And that's what the appeal can be. So let's have a quick look at pools. Um, these are things that crop up quite frequently when we're talking about um, redundancy and it's you know uh, i mentioned the, uh, the hypothetical situation where we have five five physical visual aids very helpful so five uh, people doing the same sort of work of whom two are going to be redundant all five need to be included in the pool you do need to have a think about how large the pool is going to be and that's obviously an issue particularly where there's an overlap with the sort of work that people do um, in terms of fairness, I would recommend trying to keep the pool as wide as possible, but realistically, as soon as you start getting into the process of consultation about redundancy, clearly it has a knock-on impact on um, people's attitudes um, and positivity within the workplace. So there is a, there's a balance to be struck there between keeping it as wide as possible for the sake of fairness, but not so wide or such a blanket approach that everybody involved thinks, oh my God, we're going to be made redundant. So. It's a, it's a balance to be struck and obviously we can assist with that if, if that's something you need to deal with. Um, but the narrower it is, uh, the greater the risk of unfairness. So things that you need to think about when considering the pool um, include what type of work it is that's ceasing or diminishing, um, the extent to which employees are doing similar work, the extent to which employees' jobs are interchangeable and, and that crops up quite frequently where people's roles have evolved from what they started and don't just look at what the contract says because a 15 year old contract may have very little bearing on what an employee is actually doing now. So don't be too, um, too set on what the, the documents say, do have a look at the reality of the situation. And that's quite a, quite a sensible thing generally. Um, look at what the employee actually does, I suppose is what I'm really saying. So, um, when you've got your pool, you will need to consider selection criteria. Um, and in order to be reasonable, um, selection, uh, selection criteria should, as far as possible, be objective and capable of independent verification. So that means that it shouldn't be anything that's, far, that's too subjective, like, um, and we'll come on to some of the examples of, of terrible selection criteria a bit later. Um, but also uh, some of the good ideas are, are listed in the notes. Um, potentially, selection, potentially fair selection criteria include performance and ability. So these are, I'm afraid to say, one of the uh, good reasons for making sure you have very up-to-date um, appraisals. My own experience from dealing with tribunal cases is that far too often employers have let um, appraisals drag or they end up just being a tick box exercise um, do make sure that when you do appraisals you do them uh, robustly and fairly because 
Apart from anything else, it is a good opportunity for you as an employer to keep on top of any performance issues there may be. Employees, by and large, I think, like to know that they're doing a good job and they like to know if there are things that need to be corrected. It doesn't need to be overly heavy handed, but when we come to redundancies, it's useful to have something that is um, has been carefully considered, ideally away from the, the threat, of, threat of redundancy. And it's something that an employee may find it harder to argue with if six months ago they had a, an appraisal and a particular failing was identified. Again, it doesn't need to be um, too, too heavy handed, but it's a useful objective um, tool to, to look at. Other criteria include um, length of service, although there are some caveats to that, and we'll come on to that in a second. Attendance records, again, you need to be a little bit wary, particularly where there are issues about disability. Um, and also, obviously, at the moment, we have uh, COVID and sickness um, records, but also disciplinary records are useful. And clearly, that's going to have a bearing on somebody's scoring. Um, you can attach weightings to criteria so that some may have more bearing on the outcome than others some may, may be more important um, but you need to be able to demonstrate it where you don't have those records then um, for example in relation to um, performance then you ideally will need to have it scored there and then preferably by more than one manager um, if you have that resource obviously with the smaller employer you may not have that resource but um, you will still be obliged to behave as fairly as possible and there is a risk that you could well be criticised if the selection criteria that you have chosen are um, too subjective. So some of the examples of criteria that have been rejected by tribunals include employees who, in the opinion of the manager concerned, would keep the company viable. It's such a vague idea. Um, employees who are best suited for the needs of the business under new operating conditions. Cost savings. These are <laughs> selection criteria. I came across one a few years ago, which was um, likelihood that clients would leave if they left. Particularly um, pointless where there are restrictive covenants in someone's contract of employment, preventing them taking clients anyway. So do be, do be careful about putting together a selection criteria. And when you go through the scoring exercise, do make sure you are able to justify those decisions if you need to. Um, I've mentioned length of service as a risk, last in, first out, or LIFO, used to be quite a common way of scoring people. We tend to advise against it, certainly as a, a significant um, selection criteria in these days, because it does have the risk of age discrimination, um, and also potentially sex discrimination, or even maternity discrimination if people have been off uh, for maternity leave. So do be a bit wary about that. Um, Make sure appraisals are carried out regularly and also try and ensure that you have a degree of consistency in the way that you handle appraisals. That really comes down to training of managers, I would say, um, but it's quite an important tool um, just to make sure that nobody can complain that they've been unfairly bullied or, or the reasons for the selection are unfair. Um, I mentioned attendance records. Also be aware for pregnancy related illness, maternity, or other family friendly leave that should probably be discounted. Um, also consider it where someone's been off because of disability related reasons. Both of those, as you will imagine, run the risk of leading to discrimination claims. So just be a little bit wary. Um, ultimately, it's going to be down to uh, you as the employer to decide if those selection criteria are fair. And there are rules to suggest that a tribunal shouldn't substitute its own ideas for um, for what should have been chosen. But at the same time, do make sure that you can demonstrate you've applied it fairly. Um, we've mentioned consultation, um, or I have, because I'm the only one who's speaking, um, but employees should be consulted about the scores. And that is often one of those areas where, where employees raise concerns. Uh, clearly, sometimes employees feel that they have been judge poorly for their attendance or their performance when they feel that they should be um, scored more highly. Again, that's where it's useful to be able to point to the, the records, particularly if they haven't complained about them previously. Um, and then you can demonstrate that they have no concerns. It, again, it may be that people will be able to, to raise issues that you haven't thought about. For example, the reason that 
my performance was lower on this particular occasion was because I was off sick or I was uh, off maternity leave. So don't consider that the scoring is necessarily final and do prepare, be prepared to revisit it if, if needs be. Um, quite frequently, employees um, have concerns about how they have scored against other people. I realize I'm waving my hands around, but again, visual excitement in these slightly dull days. Um, but you also need to be aware about confidentiality and not sharing other employees' information. That may be a bit more of a concern where we have, where you have for example, a pool of two people uh, where it's going to be very obvious who the other person is. Um, but I would suggest you need to, employees need to have sufficient information to be able to respond to the, the consultation or respond to the scoring, but do be aware about not sharing too much information unless you have to. Um, I'm going to take a quick pause there if anyone has any questions. Oh, we have a question. Um, for people coming back from Spain, as they need to self-isolate and therefore unable to work, do I need to pay these employees no clause in contract regarding this? Um, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Um, I suppose there are a couple of uh, a couple of issues at the moment. Clearly, a lot of people are working remotely. That isn't always going to be um, useful because there are clearly some some types of work that cannot be done remotely. Um, so if an employee is unable to work, I would possibly consider maybe sick leave. Um, there's also obviously the furlough scheme, uh, although that's coming to an end very shortly, uh, certainly at the end of October. Um, I w I, I'm afraid that the simple answer, which is a, a, is a standard employ employment lawyer answer, is it will depend. Um, because this isn't particularly related to redundancy, I may come back to that. So if the person who submitted that would like to leave their details, we can deal with that separately. Um, okay, another question is, how do you balance excessive sick absence in redundancy? Well, I suppose the question there is the definition of excessive. Um, with all the sickness absence, you do need to be very wary about how you respond to it. Um, clearly, there are going to be situations in which to use a, a very archaic uh, term employees are swinging the lead. Um, there are, however, also going to be occasions where somebody is off uh, on sick. Sorry, I can just hear my cat, and she obviously takes breath. Come on now. Good girl. Um, sorry about that. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, yes, so sometimes you will have employees who have long periods of sick leave, um, and that may well be because of disability. So you do need to be very wary about that. Um, and if someone has excessive sick leave, I would suggest um, making sure that there is nothing untoward uh, behind it. I've had cases in the past where employers have complained that, an empl that their employee is um, just taking far too much time off. And it turns out that that employee has suffered from depression or sickness, which is because it is significant and has a substantial adverse effect on their ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities, they are disabled within the meaning of the Equality Act. And that means that you have certain obligations on them, obviously not to discriminate. You also have to consider reasonable adjustments. And it may very well be that if somebody has had a lot of sick leave, that it could be a reasonable adjustment to, to consider whether sick leave is uh, really the, the metric to judge them on. So I'm sorry, that's a, another slightly vague answer, but um, if somebody is clearly off on a lot of sick leave then, um, and there's no disability behind it, then it certainly it is a factor to consider. Um, but just be a little bit wary about how quickly you leap to an assumption that they are not disabled, I suppose. And that's something to be, to be borne in mind quite generally. Okay, so I'll um, go back to the, to the, uh, the procedure. I've mentioned um, uh, alternative roles. You're not under any obligation to create a new role. Um, and one of the questions that frequently crops up is, um, sorry, I've just noticed that we have another question. Um, a pool such as BA workers could consist of many hundreds of people. Would you have one pool for, say, pilots and another for stewards and stewardesses? 
uh, or can they be mixed? Um, I would say, and obviously the BA case is quite a quite a high profile one, um, but I would suggest that um, because they do different types of work, they should be treated separately. Um, obviously, as I say, it's convoluted, but the outcome may very well be the same. But I think it's reasonable; it would be reasonable for a steward uh, to argue that even though there may be a reduced requirement for pilots, if there are still flights, then they should still be considered for them. Um, so I, I think in that sort of situation, I would probably keep them separate. As I say, just because you have um, people doing different types of work, that doesn't mean that they should all be in the same pool and you could have more than one run redundancy process and more than one pool running at, at the same time. Um, so for example, if your business is losing five people from admin, and three people from sales, um, there may be an overlap. That may not have been a good example, but there may be an overlap. But at the same time, it's probably better to keep the two, two pools separate, um, although bear in mind alternative roles. You're not under any duty to bump employees, um, but do bear it in mind because it may be, it may be useful. Um, so I hope that's uh, answered that question. Um, Maternity leave is another um, issue. Um, some people seem to think that um, because uh, somebody is off maternity leave, they are protected from dismissal. That's not for redundancy, and that's not quite true. Uh, they can still be uh, selected for redundancy, but the main point is that they have essentially first dibs on any alternative roles that there may be. Um, so. There are also other questions when somebody is off on maternity leave about how to conduct a redundancy. And in a way, things are possibly a little bit easier in this time of people working from home because um, being able to have meetings remotely is something that is a lot more common. But again, I think particularly at the moment, as employers, you probably need to be a little bit more creative about how you engage with people and that will certainly have a bearing on consultation. But clearly, as many people are much more familiar with Zoom and Teams and Skype and all those other um, social networking or, or chat platforms, it's a lot easier to have conversations with people who would otherwise not be coming into work. So just because somebody is not on, uh, is on maternity leave doesn't mean that they are, should be excluded from the process. And it, clearly, there's a, there's a potential risk of unfairness if they are not included in the process at all. It's just that they have an automatic right to be offered any suitable vacancies there may be. So in the notes, I've put in some practical guidance. I'm afraid I don't have the page numbers, but uh, hopefully they are fairly easy to find. Sorry, I have another few questions have cropped up. Let me just open that. Um, uh, I will. Um, OK, so the question is business is halved. Um, I don't know if this is something that needs that the person answering wants to be sorry asking wants to be answered as a group. So I will let you um, let me know about that, um, and we'll uh, we can possibly come back to that in a second. Um, it's about yes business as well. So um, yes, I, I've as I've put in the the notes some practical guidance, um, and we'll just go through some of that uh, now. The, the main thing, with it, as with any um, employment procedure, is plan, because um, that is usually where you can avoid some of the, the pitfalls of these things. Um, there is obviously a balance to be struck between planning and deciding on the outcome. And as I mentioned at the outset, it's important that you are not uh, obviously um, already decided on your course of action when you begin the process, because the employee could very fairly say that the procedure is a sham, the decision has already been reached, and there's nothing they may say that can, can vary the outcome. You want to avoid that as much as you can, um, but at the same time, it's important that managers and the people who are dealing with the procedure know their obligations. And I presume that, that many of the people involved in this today are people who work in HR, um, or in some other ways are dealing with the management of employees. So make sure you're familiar with your procedures um, and hopefully these notes will be of some assistance. Obviously, we're available if you have any particular questions and we're happy to, to assist on that. Um, ensure that the people who will be dealing with the, the 
meetings are available. Clearly, we are largely working remotely, um, but make sure that if people do um, have to engage with uh, a redundancy procedure, they can devote sufficient time and attention to it. Um, you don't want to have people who are um, only half attending to the, the process. Um, check HR records, make sure that they are sufficiently comprehensive. If they are not, then you need to consider um, uh, who needs to, whether people should be scoring them. Um, and as I say, if you can have at least more, more than one manager doing it, because if one person scores an employee on, for example, performance or attendance, um, there's the risk that the employee could reasonably say, well, that person had a, a grudge against me, um, so that's not fair. And as with most employment matters, fairness is absolutely uh, vital to, to how you proceed. Um, include absent employees in the process. I mentioned some people on maternity leave, but obviously if people are off sick, um, that is relevant as well. Um, one of the things you frequently uh, come up against, particularly where we're dealing with disciplinary matters, and to be absolutely clear, this is not a disciplinary matter and should not be treated in the same way as a disciplinary matter, but you get people saying, I'm too sick to work. And the if you wish to be a little bit firmer about this, um, you are not asking someone to work, you are asking someone to engage in a redundancy process. And there is an argument that it is fairer for somebody to um, actually have a say in the potential outcome of their employment than not. Um, so do consider um, ways of ways around that. If it's not going to be in person, um, and if it's not going to be via online um, discussion, then it may be um, that it's appropriate to do it by letter or email. Um, but really just, again, with a lot of these things, try and be as creative and as open as you can, because as long as you are able to be transparent, it will be a lot harder for an employee to argue that they've been unfairly treated. Um, obviously, sometimes employees refuse to attend consultation meetings. And if they do, you need to have a think about or find out why that is the case. Um, try not to leap to conclusions. Um, there may be perfectly reasonable reasons why they don't want to engage in the process. But as I say, try and be creative and maybe put it in writing invite submissions by writing and that can be a way of, of moving things forward. Um, if they absolutely refuse to participate then you may have to decide to proceed in the employee's absence but that will be another opportunity to make sure that you offer um, an appeal because then if the employee complains oh I didn't have an opportunity to be heard the appeal is their, their, their further opportunity. Um, I've also put in a step-by-step -step guide, which again will hopefully be a, a good sort of place to, to refer back. I've mentioned the, uh, the nature about engaging in a consultation process. And the first step in any of these redundancy procedures is to warn people that there is a risk of redundancy. Um, again, if you can meet with employees, obviously you can do group um, Zoom or team or whatever chats. Um, it may be harder to do these days um, and some workplaces are not particularly well set up with that sort of discussion. But if you can th have those discussions then it's important to do that as, at a, as fundamental as, or an early stage as you can. And what you're essentially saying is that redundancy is a possibility. It shouldn't be a determined thing um, but you are looking at alternative uh, alternative alternatives excuse me to redundancy and that as i mentioned at the outset is quite an important thing to to consider um the last time there was there were uh, there was a big recession as i mentioned people were a lot more creative i think than they had been previously about um alternatives to redundancy and those can can involve things like um, short time working. Obviously at the moment we have the furlough scheme uh, which isn't going to last forever but um, realistically it is going to be um, possibly a way of avoiding redundancies. My concern obviously is that at the end of the furlough scheme there may be redundancies because um, businesses that have been kept on this slightly artificial lifeline may long, no longer be able to continue that. Um, but other things can in, include part-time working, job share, um, 
some people may be prepared to to work reduced hours on a reduced salary for the sake of keeping their uh keeping their role um or their job in the in the hope that at some point in the future the uh, the business may pick up and the job may still uh may also uh, pick up um got a question has come in which i think is sort of related which is how do you deal with an employee who goes off sick after the initial meeting stress related with the doctor's note um yes that's obviously uh, quite a tricky situation and not as i'm sure many people who've dealt with these things not entirely surprising or unexpected um again i think the the line to take is possibly um one the employee is not being asked to work they are being uh, invited to consult on something that has a bearing on their potential employment and it's something that you need their input on um, and for that reason even if they may be un, unfit to work it's probably reasonable to ask them to to engage with the process secondly quite frequently doctors will um, will agree and there's quite a bit of case law on this that um, having something like this hanging over an employee is in itself a stressful situation that needs to be resolved um, ultimately if neither of those things work then you will need to consider um, proceeding um, in other ways and I've mentioned putting it in writing which may be a slightly less stressful um, way of proceeding but ultimately just because somebody is off sick doesn't mean that they um, essentially get out of being selected for redundancy the best you can do is to demonstrate that you are behaving fairly and as creatively as you can with the limitations of the employee's engagement. So um, I don't think that just because an employee is off sick means that they are um, ex should be excluded from the redundancy process. And as I say, they are not being asked to work. It's a slightly separate issue from working. So if somebody is not fit to work, that doesn't necessarily have a bearing on redundancy procedures. So I think that is probably what I would say. Ultimately, if someone simply doesn't engage with the process, you may have to proceed in their absence. Um, but as long as you've taken steps to try and engage with them, um, I think it's unlikely you would be criticised for that. Um, again, you possibly need to consider the nature of the sickness. Um, stress sometimes is related to disability, sometimes it is just stress. Um, but if you have concerns about the nature of uh, the, pers the individual's illness, then consider occupational health, um, consider any adjustments that may be appropriate to engage them in, in, in that process. Um, so I've discussed the initial meeting on the step-by-step -step guide. Um, scoring, I think we've discussed, and hopefully that's reasonably clear. Um, once you have undertaken that process, you need to invite the employee to attend a consultation meeting. Um, and the letter should be reasonably detailed. Again, you have not yet made a decision as to redundancy. It is a risk. Um, but what you need to explain are the reasons for the redundancy. Now, that may well be that because of the downturn in the economy, we have a reduced requirement for people to manufacture widgets, do whatever the particular role is. These are your scores. This is the, the methodology behind our, our scoring and give the, the employee the opportunity to, to consider it. Um, you should make absolutely clear that there's no no decision has yet been made um, and no final decision uh, so you are capable of having your mind changed and that is quite a useful thing to to make it absolutely clear about and then you actually have to have the consultation meeting itself which as i say at the moment is possibly likely to be remote um, if your business is still functioning in person then provided safe distancing is um, is used then you can do that in person um, as I say, I would re recommend giving somebody the right to be accompanied. I've been thinking about this. I'm not quite sure how you do that remotely, but I suppose you could have somebody else joining the call. Um, but it, again, you need to be aware of the risks, uh, be aware of the concerns of the employee and try and demonstrate that you're, you are bearing them in mind. Um, while I pause where we are, we've got another question. Um, should remote working now be considered as an offer to somebody where travel distance would have meant um, uh, the SAE test could fail in an ET in the past? Um, I think at the moment, I mean, one of the, the issues with um, 
the way we're all working at the moment is that um, some of the business changes that have been quite a long time coming, for example, remote working have escalated at a pace no one was expecting. And for example, in relation to travel distance, I think there is probably a reasonable question as to whether um, whether somebody needs physically to be in a in a place of work and if you feel that they do you will need to demonstrate exactly why that is particularly as many businesses are if not working absolutely at their their best are functioning at the very least so i think probably um remote working is something that that needs to be considered as as a variation to terms or as an alternative um an alternative role ultimately ultimately it really comes down to what the job is, what your requirements are as an employer, and whether or not those needs can be met, and if so, in what way. So uh, I keep mentioning creativity, and I think this is a prime example, where there is an option for, um, for different ways of doing it, I think you probably need to offer it. You need to get people's, it's a horrible expression, but get their buy-in to, to different ways of working. And if the outcome is essentially they are doing their same job, but in a slightly different way, then I suppose you really have to question whether it's a redundancy in the first place. So um, do bear that in mind. Um, so that's the first consultation meeting, going back to my earlier uh, chain. Once that meeting has happened, again, please don't, some of the worst cases we deal with are where at the end of that meeting, um, employers say right we've decided to make you redundant because it's very clear that they haven't actually been listening to a single thing the employees said and they were going to do it anyway follow it up with a letter or an email um, consider any suggestions the employee may, has re may have raised don't reject them out of hand particularly if they are reasonable if you don't think that they are functional or viable then explain why that is the case um, if there's alternative employment, then consider that um, and then invite them to another meeting. It's usually at that meeting or depending on what the employee says in that meeting, certainly after that meeting, you can confirm redundancy subject to uh, the right to appeal. Um, if the employee appeals, then try and have somebody as far as you can who is senior to the person who made the original decision to listen to it. Um, again, not all employers have that um, scope of management um, and if you don't have it then you don't have it and you're probably not going to be criticized for it so general principle under the employment rights act that larger employers are going to be held to a higher standard than a small employer that doesn't mean as a small employer you can uh, ride roughshod over the rules it just means you have a little bit more flexibility so um, where possible get somebody else to hear the appeal uh, just to demonstrate that you're not a judge in your own cause and that you're behaving as fairly as possible. Um, in the notes I've mentioned time off to seek alternative employment. It's really just good employment practice but it's also um, an obligation under section 52 of the Employment Rights Act. If you have no longer a requirement for someone to do work for you it's only fair really to let them try and find other work and give them time off to, to do that. Um, having said that many employers um, don't particularly want a redundant employee hanging around for the duration of their notice period um, and I haven't really covered redundancy payments but we'll come on to that now. Um, if somebody has been employed for, for under two years then they are not entitled to a redundancy payment. They are however entitled to their notice pay. Um, if they've been employed for more than two years then they are entitled to a redundancy payment and when I started doing this back a few years ago, um, there was a table and it would have on one axis, it would have age on the other axis length of service and it would provide you with a multiplier and you would multiply um, weekly pay by that. The simple answer is go on to the government website. There is a simple redundancy calculator. If you Google redundancy calculator, you will find it. And you just put in the employee's age, the length of service, their salary. Currently, salary is capped at 538 pounds. Um, but in the online calculator, you can put in their full weekly pay um, and it will spit out the redundancy payment. And that, I think, is the simplest way to proceed on that basis. Um, it's also worth considering if there are contractual redundancy payments. It, I think it happens less and less, but some employers have uh, contractual redundancy policies, as I mentioned earlier, um, and may have contractual redundancy payments. Um, if that is the case, 
uh, and it is purely contractual, then don't ignore it because failure to pay it may be a breach of contract, which in itself may entitle an employee to bring a claim against you. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is sometimes employers like to offer um, compensation over and above a redundancy payment and the notice pay. That's absolutely fine. If you do want to do that, then please, please, please get them to sign a settlement agreement because there is absolutely no point in you giving somebody more than they're contractually entitled to without you as the employer getting back the certainty that you will not be sued by them in the future. Um, I don't say that to be malicious, but realistically, um, if you're going to pay somebody over and above what they're entitled to, then you may as well get something something back. I mean, again and again, I, I've dealt with cases where employers have been generous and given somebody more than they're entitled to, and the employer, the employee rather, has gone on and has sued the employee employer anyway. If it were to go to tribunal and the employer were to be found to have unfairly dismissed the employee, then I imagine there would be some account made for the extra payment they have made um, very much depends on the attitude of the tribunal um, and as I say at the moment uh, a claim for redundancy that is lodged now probably will not be heard for another couple of years. Um, obviously if you if you <clears throat> excuse me if you're in that unfortunate position there is always the opportunity to settle or, or engage in consultation on conciliation by ACAS um, and realistically it's probably worth considering because the length of time a tribunal claim is going to take at the moment and the cost that is associated with that is large is likely to be absolutely excessive um to the uh, to the benefit uh, compared to the benefit for the employees in one case and certainly for the employees in another um as i, I mentioned polky deductions earlier and that is one of the the um saving graces for uh for employers, albeit one that may feel a bit of a pyrrhic victory if you go to tribunal and spend 10, 15, 20,000 pounds defending a case. If you are, if you're able to demonstrate that you've, you had a genuine redundancy in the first place and you have followed a fair procedure, then the likelihood is that any award will be minimal or even non-existent depending on, on the attitude of the tribunal. But ideally, try and avoid going to tribunal because it's not really anybody's idea of a good day out. Um, at the very end of the, the, the notes that I've included, a very brief summary of the impact of coronavirus. Um, it's a very mixed bag at the moment, and obviously um, everything's a bit up in the air and the situation is changing quite frequently and quite rapidly. At the moment, the furlough scheme is still running and will run until the end of October. There will be situations in which it is appropriate to make employees redundant now, but do bear in mind there is a risk that they could well argue um, that they should not be made redundant because it's premature to make a decision on the state of the business after the furlough scheme has expired. Some organisations, some employers will be able to make that decision based on the nature of their, obviously the nature of their business. But for example, if their their order, if their order book runs in six, you know, nine months uh, in advance, they will know that at some point in the in the near future there will not be work available for employees, and that may well be um, worth considering. Um, but I think do consider the furlough scheme certainly in the short term. Um, before making people redundant because I think it will save uh, potential risk in the future. Um, I realise I'm coming up to 11 o'clock which is when the seminar is supposed to finish um, but I will happily deal with a few more questions. Um, uh, if uh, there's a, a couple which I, I think are probably best answered um, separately um, but uh, yes, if you do have any questions, do, do put them in the chat or in the Q&As. Um, if you don't have any questions, thank you very much for joining us. I'm sorry, it's obviously slightly unusual. Um, and uh, thank you again. If you do have any questions, do let me know either on the chat here or by email. I think my details are on the, uh, on the notes. And obviously, uh, as an employment team, we're, we're very happy to assist as much as we can. So uh, thank you very much and uh, hopefully see you all again either back in my spare room or in the office at some point in the future.
Uh, someone's asked about access to the notes. I think they should have been circulated. If you haven't got them, then please uh, drop us your email and we can send them to you directly. Um, but hopefully they will be circulatable. I don't know if we can do it uh, via Zoom, but, um, but hopefully that's a help. Um, but if no one has any other questions, um, I will say goodbye for now and um, thank you very much.